Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Biz Books. My name is Gene Marks. This is my opportunity to interview some really smart people who have written really great business books and your opportunity to listen or watch and learn from those smart people. And the smart person I'm talking to today is Phil Simon. Phil has written Project Management in the Hybrid Workplace. First of all, Phil, thank you very much for joining me. I'm glad that you're here from Arizona. Hey, Gene, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to our chat. Yeah, we have a lot to talk about. I read your book cover to cover. I took like a bunch of notes, like 11 pages of notes here, which- Oh, you were the one. All of them. I know. Uh, This will be easy for you. Trust me. It's just, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but it's just more memory joggers for me than anything else. Um, But it it was a great book. It's about project management for project managers. Uh, But first of all, a little bit about yourself. Like, Tell us a little bit about who you are and, and why you wrote the book. Sure. I've written now 13 books. Project Management in the Hybrid Workplace was number 12, and that's the focus of today. But before then, um, I did a lot of consulting and still do to some extent today. I'm a former, I'd say, recovering college professor. A million years ago, I used to work in HR. I run a small publishing company. So like you, I wear quite a few hats. I I do public speaking. Um, It's really um, a matter of putting a number of chips on the roulette table and hoping that uh, the number comes up because I'm not smart enough to just focus on one area. And they're all adjacent. It's not like like you, uh, well, I shouldn't speak for you, but I, I don't do yep. French French poetry and interpretive dance. And oh, by the way, <laughs> write business books. So they're all sort of adjacent areas and certainly not uncommon for writers and speakers like ourselves. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. And, uh, you know, and this is such a, a topical topic. I mean, you know, managing people, you know, when they're they're basically not face to face anymore, all of that has changed. But even before we dig into that, you know, before we started recording, you had mentioned, because I'm from Philly, you did a project, you said, you know, at a, at a hospital in Philadelphia, the hospital I was born, uh, just by coincidence. And, you know, and you were saying that it was, you know, it was a struggling project. And it's just, you know, the reason why I was wanting, I wanted to read this book, Phil, is that like, my even though I do a lot of writing and speaking and all that, really my day job is I run a ten person company and we implement CRM systems. Um, you know we do like Salesforce and Dynamics and Zoho, so we do projects and we've had good projects and we have had nightmares. You know, I mean we have had profanity filled violence. You know, on some of our some of our projects. Um, and and I personally am challenged now with with you know running these things in a sort of a virtual environment. Although my company has been virtual since 2005, so I'm going to just kind of start out and just just ask you like you know, I guess you you know, the, the idea from this book came from the fact that you know everybody went home to work you know and and yet life still went on and that that created a whole bunch of new issues for people running projects right. Yeah, that was part of it. Um, my previous book to this one, Reimagining Collaboration, um, espouses the benefits of Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Slack for just general collaboration, um, right. sort of the day-to-day stuff. But a large part of what we do, by some accounts and some statistics, I've seen two-thirds of all quote-unquote work is project-oriented. So when the pandemic happened, my contention is, and the data supports this, that if you worked in a process-oriented job, It's a little bit different, but it really wasn't that much of a shift. In other words, if you processed checks, if you did insurance claims, if you were a customer relations rep like I was when I had a full head of hair, (laughs) uh, that didn't change all that much because you would just dial in from home and there might have been some hardware concerns or maybe you heard the dog in the background, but that went off relatively without a hitch. Going back to that Philadelphia project in 2006, it was an ERP, not an ER not a CRM project, but those are very similar. And that was all in person and that project blew up. So um, as I worked on a number of hybrid or remote projects during the pandemic for consulting or writing, and I even start off the book with one that should have been a slam dunk. Mm. But within two weeks, it went gone off the rails. And within six weeks, it had absolutely imploded. And it was very much a hybrid project. And a lot of the issues on that particular writing gig stem from different time zones and preferences with technology and things lost in translation and an inability to use common tools. So I said to myself, um, and I think I start off that book with a great Seinfeld quote about how we never should have put a man on the moon. Right. Because now we can say, well, we can put a man on the moon, but we yeah, can't no. get this project right. So uh, it just occurred to me that maybe this was an extreme example, but a lot of the interactions on a project can take place virtually, 
but we lose something. So as a good example, if you and I are working on a project together and you say something in a meeting, I could tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, Gene, you have a second. Well, if we're all hybrid or remote, then I could throw you a message in Slack or email or even text you. I don't know if you got it. I don't know if you understood it. I don't know when you're going to respond. So there's an example of the book of um, a friend of mine who used to be one of my best students at Arizona State when I was a professor there, he said he had a five minute question. It took him five days of response. And when you think about project management as the cu- accumulation of all these certainly milestones, but also individual tasks that make up those milestones, little, to quote the immortal Kevin Hart, little problems become big problems. <laughs> so, And I didn't see of the 30,000 books on project management on Amazon at the time, I certainly didn't see one specific to hybrid project management. So I think I did a decent job in the book, Gene, of not trying to reinvent the wheel. And there is one cha- one chapter, chapter four, that gets deep into project management. But I certainly don't have a new methodology, but I want to manifest some of the things that companies and individuals and team leaders ought to consider to increase their batting averages. Okay, so a little bit of a curveball throw you here, which you, um, because this is not in your book, because it's just data that just got released this last week, and I just wrote about it. The um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, released a, a big time study analysis of workers working from home versus working in the office during 2021. So it's very, very recent data. And they found that the average employee working from home uh, worked, actually worked on their job about five and a half hours a day compared to the average employee working in the office who worked about seven and a half hours a day. Um, And this is, again, this is time studies and it was a pretty extensive amount of research that was done. You, you give you, you early on in your book, you, you talk about, you know, I, uh, you know, the reporting that was done about how many people want to work in the office, you know, and (laughs) You know, the numbers came out where it was between like 40 and 50% of these people, the employees that were surveyed, um, either wanted to work from no, not at all in the office to like no more than two days a week in the office, you know, um, which presents a huge issue for project managers because it's the data is showing that when people work for, and I'm not saying everybody, you can't generalize. There are some people that work really hard from home, but, you know, we all know that there are other people that don't. So the sure. averages are showing that there's less work being done hybrid. Yeah. And it's a huge challenge for project managers. How do you- We, we can have a very long discussion about that because one could make the argument and I haven't seen that particular data, but I'm mm-hmm. just going to play devil's advocate in that seven and a half hours is a lot of it kabuki theater, right? We're sitting in the meeting and we're pontificating or mm-hmm. we're doing True. whatever versus at home where no one's watching us. Are we being a little bit more authentic with our time? I'm not saying that people don't slack off from home. Clearly they do. Mm. And I'm not saying that people are always hundred percent productive when they're at work. Right. And this idea, I remember when BYOD became a thing, bring your own device. You no, know, we got to stop that because it'll stop them from slacking. Right. So, Good, good luck with that because people will find a way, whether it's grabbing a cigarette break or taking an extra long lunch. So uh, yeah, the data that you referenced from my book uh, is usually anywhere from two to three days. And I find it really interesting when companies like Slap, um, Snap, excuse me, never mind, uh, Twitter yep. mandate that you have to be in the office like COVID never happened. That might work short term, but enough companies, as you know, Gene, have crossed the Rubicon And whether I'm not saying no one should ever be in the office or you should never work at home. I do think, though, that this is why I wrote the book. The future is going to be hybrid. It just doesn't make sense. There are real estate costs with having everyone with a desk. And if I can do the work, if it's collaborative, if it's team building, if it's a performance review discussion, if it's brainstorming, anything like that, I'd be hard pressed to make the argument that that is as good over Zoom. But if I'm going in to really focus and do what Cal Newport calls deep work, I'm sorry, why do I need to commute an hour and a half each way to do that? Right. So that leads this um, gray area in between. But but you're right to the extent that project managers are often herding cats. um, It's tough for them to get the basic um, status update of things. It's one of the reasons, for example, that I recommend from the get go, particularly if you're dealing with multiple organizations, you settle on the tools or the tech. Because if everyone says, well, I'm going to use whatever I want, well, your project manager's job just got 10 times harder. Yeah, it makes it, it makes complete sense. Um, all right, let's dig into some of the concepts that you talked about in your book. Um, one of the things that you wrote about is something called proximity bias. Can you explain what that is? 
Yeah, that it, in layman's terms, it means that if you're out of sight, you're out of mind. The Slack feature forum, which is part of now Salesforce since the acquisition a couple of years ago, time flies, did some really compelling research. And it was something like 41% of managers up from, I think, 36% the previous quarter said that that was their biggest problem. Like basically, a caste system gene would result from the fact that when I see Gene in the office, forget whether he's doing anything. Right. He's there. He's working. And Phil, where the hell is he? Oh, I don't even know. Out of sight, out of mind. So even though one person might be working harder or more efficiently or producing better output, the fact that we don't see someone invariably affects how we look at them. And I thought it was really important to cover these types of cognitive biases because they've always been around. But if everyone, and, and I make this point fairly early on in the book, you can we can debate all day long whether something should be remote or at, at, um, in person in the office. Right. But if everyone's there, there's no proximity bias, right? But once you have it, well, sometimes he's in, sometimes not. His manager requires it, his doesn't. Oh, it's a Tuesday versus a Thursday. That all factors into how we perceive things. And uh, there's just a number of different biases that affect how we look at things. So it's silly to assume that, you're going to have equal presence, even though companies like Google, and I just saw on um, this uh, Wall Street Journal video on YouTube with Citrix, they redid their whole headquarters. So now they took great pains to make sure that if you were there virtually or physically, you had the same presence. They even designed the rooms such that there'd be a, the equal view of people if they were on a screen. They were very thoughtful about it. But it's still not the same as if you and I are sitting at the same table. Um, we might have reduced the discrepancy, uh, but I'd argue we certainly haven't eliminated it. And is the point of writing about proximity bias for a project manager to, to say to that person, listen, just because you, you know, members of your team aren't there physically, don't get it into your head that they're not you know, keeping up their end of the project. Is that, is that, is that the point? That, that's part of it. I mean, I didn't write this book exclusively for project managers, but mm -hmm. proximity bias affects all of us, mm -hmm. right? You can be on a team of consultants and there's one person who's remote that day. There's just this natural tendency to think that he or she isn't putting in the effort, which is really unfortunate. It doesn't make us evil. It just makes us human. Right. It's only natural, right? I mean, I've gotten fired from jobs because I left on time. Who the hell are you to leave on time? Well, you know that I did get here at 7 a.m. and work through yeah. lunch, right. right? And I automated the hell out of things. So while you guys are here doing things manually, um, so it's only natural for us to look at things that way. But again, I'm of the opinion that we're, we can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Um, hybrid is here to stay. So the question isn't um, what are these biases? The question is how do we adjust to this new reality? Uh, because if COVID were two days or two weeks, it's a snow day. Hmm. It's been over two and a half years. Hmm. So companies ask employees to work remotely, and we did. And by all accounts, and I cite a lot of data from this, people have been as productive, if not more so from home. And this is managers talking. Hmm. But also, there's some data from Sherm that I cite in the book about how basically old white guys like me want hmm. everyone to go back into the office because that's the way we had to do it. And if you have to commute two hours each way, then so be it. So I just think that generally speaking, these are issues that people are going to have to deal with. And hopefully my book provides some um, useful advice about how they can better cope with this new reality. It's good to hear. Um, you also write about efficiency um, and, you know, you, 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 you talk about you know, efficiency on projects and how, you know, more efficiency means less resilience. Right. And again, more resilience can turn into less efficiency, you know, and if you're too efficient, if you err on the side of extreme efficiency, um, you make your other systems fragile. And I was wondering if you could expand on that. Like you would think that we would want to be as efficient as possible. But my takeaway is that there are some there are some downsides to that. 100%. And it's it's funny because before the show, Eugene, we were talking about Christopher Mims and, and mm. his book. And that was very much on my mind when I was reading it. And he was talking about how we had optimized the supply chain for efficiency. And then right. the problem is that when there's a glitch, that reverberates through the entire thing. So that's just a premise of lean manufacturing and just-in-time inventory. Well, the same thing applies to these projects. So when you've got COVID, depending on your vaccine status and other health factors, you may not be productive. So the project that's perfectly resourced, for lack of a better term, mm. is so susceptible to mm. one person. And I, there's an example in the book of um, a college that had staffed its um, future semester classes perfectly. 
But when one person says, I'm not coming back, it causes whole chain reaction. And to the extent that, and you know this, project management is not exactly a home run. According to PMI, it's something like 56% of projects hit their numbers, and it's a little bit higher when they fire when they abide by their talent triangle, it's still basically three and five. That's not a great percentage. So I'm not saying that you hire a bunch of people to sit around and do nothing, but the idea that in six months, you'll be able to predict everyone will have been able to do X, Y, and Z without any sort of delay, um, I just think is folly. So building a little resilience, even if it's a let, less efficient method, uh, may not be a bad idea. Is building resilience the same thing as having, you know, from a financial standpoint, like having reserves, you know, like you're just, you're building in reserves for mistakes or to bend or to not do things in a perfect way? Yeah, I think that's a great analogy. Um, God forbid if you're an independent business person and one of your client doesn't, clients doesn't pay you. Yes. Um, you could argue that there's such a thing as too much resiliency because I just saw on the Wall Street Journal today that... The average bank is offering 0.5% interest rates when interest rates are seven and seven and a half percent with inflation. Yeah. So if you keep hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash or under your mattress, you are losing out. So yeah, I, I'm not arguing that, as I said, you should have 20 people sitting around twiddling their thumbs in case something happens. But if you're thinking that you're going to stick the landing over and over again, you really are playing with fire. Got it. You know, you write at the beginning of the book and then you revisit it a little bit later on about um um, pro project management professionals, like being like a PMP, um, which is a certification for the industry itself. And, and you're right, is that if you, to be a PMP, you have to get like, you know, you, you get expertise in certain areas of, you know, knowledge areas, you know, integration management and scope management and risk management. And I'm just, I'm kind of curious, like, you know, do you put a lot of weight behind people that are, that are PMPs? Do you, if you're a, if you're an organization and you do a product, I mean, should I be hiring PMPs to run my CRM projects? Here's the way I look at it. Um, if you've got a PMP, that's great. But lacking one is neither necessary nor sufficient for success. Okay. So when I think about my own career, and I don't have a PMP certification, and I'm not dunking on them, there's definitely value in going through that. But okay. if I'm a 22-year-old 22 recent college grad who's never managed a project in the real world, um, you're pretty green. Yeah. Conversely, if you're a grizzled 50 year old vet like I am and you haven't <laughs> taken it before, but you've seen this movie a few times, you probably know how to deal with a difficult person. Otherwise, you still wouldn't be a project manager. So right. it can't hurt. But the idea that you can spend three months studying and pass a test, especially with what we're seeing now with some of the artificial intelligence out there, um, can't hurt. But uh, that the presence of that alone does not, by definition, make that person effective. Got it. Okay. Fair enough. Um, let's keep digging in. I, you know, I, and by the way, when, when I have these conversations with, with people about their books, I just want you, I'm not, we're, I, I'm trying, I, it's like a, it's like a balancing act for me in the, in the time that we have not to give away too much. It's in the book because I want people to buy the book, you know? So, but so we're, we're covering some of like the, the broad points, but some to me, some of the more interesting points I think are fun to talk about. You write about something called um, the gold rats theory of constraints. All right. <laughs> tell me what, what that is or tell our, tell our listeners. Yeah, there are a lot of different versions of it, but uh, a, a <laughs> common offshoot of it, if you like, is fast, cheap, and good. Pick any two of the three. Okay. I laugh when I hear people say, oh, we've, we've we've optimized across all these different dimensions. We can pay people as little as possible and get these amazing results always on time. No, you can't. Um, and there, I mean, I actually thought it was interesting to visit some of the principles behind traditional project management mm -hmm. in this new context of a, of a COVID world. Because again, managing in-person projects has never been easy. And now you're throwing in proximity bias and different tools. And I mean, even some cases, as you know, Gene, le legitimate, uh, boring logistical issues. Oh, I, my internet connection isn't great. Not yeah. everyone's in the office. So I thought it was fun to kind of look at those historical um, concepts, for lack of a better term, against this lens of, of COVID to see how they hold up. And as I thought when I wrote the book, and, and I make this point in all my books, but it's particularly apropos here. Um, I don't have all the answers. You can follow all my advice and still fail. You could ignore it and still succeed. But generally speaking, if you do things like get everyone together once in a while so they could break bread, if you can do a project pre-mortem, not a post-mortem, um, you're increasing your batting average. Got it. You know, you do take some time to go through some classical, you know, theories and methodologies, you know, for people that are students of project management. You talk about something called the waterfall method as well. Yeah. What's that? 
Oh, it's uh, I spent the uh, the aughts uh, basically helping companies implement systems through a very sequential and rigid method. And there are a lot of different monikers for it, phase gate method or systems development lifecycle SDLC, but it ultimately comes down to a series of phases. Right. So it might be things like making the business case for a new system or project and gathering all the requirements and vetting all the vendors and training all the people how to use it and gathering the business requirements and implementing it and cleaning the data and then going live. And that's one way to do it. And in fact, as I used to tell my students as a college professor, apart from systems, there are certain things that you want to make sure work out of the gate, sure. right? So sure. cars and drugs and airplanes, you don't sure. want to fix them later. This isn't a snap on my iPhone 14 Pro not working a certain feature, I'll live, they'll issue an update. Um, waterfall or phase gate method is very different than agile methods like Scrum, in which case, and, and they're very different methods, but with Scrum or an agile method, you're saying we can't predict the future. We don't know what's going to happen, so we're not even going to try. And rather than try to boil the ocean and do everything at once, we're going to release a product every two to three sprints, maybe every month. Um, so those are the two ways of doing it. There's a third way that some people call agile fall or... Um, right. Uh, and I just think that's like trying to get a little bit pregnant, <laughs> you, you know, or uh, I think in the book, I say something like I'm in a, a polygamous relationship, except every other <laughs> Tuesday after the uh, winter solstice, unless it's an even year, yeah. uh, it's only a matter of time before that's going to break bad. But yeah, well, I feel I, like the agile, like being at like an agile methodology is, or an agile methodology is where you're, you know, you're, you're kind of fixing things as you go. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, right. right. I Which mean, is. You're not supposed to try to, I think you wrote about like, you know, don't try to fix a plane while it's in the air, but there are some projects that you, to be agile, that's something that you're kind of forced to do, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, when you think about agile methods, a product owner should, in theory, be aware of those types of things, but sure. no product owner can predict the future. So if you're, I don't want to say Twitter because it's such a nightmare right now, but let's just say you were... Um, uh, let's go with uh, Amazon and yeah. you were launching a product and Google was working on a similar product. Well, they got right. to market first and it's got new features under the waterfall method. You wouldn't care because you have your plan set up a year or two in advance versus with agile method. You'd say, oh, I think we need to change course now because there's this little thing called reality. Yeah. And we can't pretend like another company. But yeah, it, I guess the point as it relates to the book is that regardless of the methodology that you're following and, and they're each valid, yeah. uh, the, the, these hybrid challenges are going to affect all of them, right? If you're not using the same tool or you don't know your colleagues beyond just an email address or a Slack or Microsoft Teams avatar, that's going to plague you regardless of how you're getting it done. You know, um, and and so let's get into some of the issues when you're dealing with a hybrid, you know, project. I mean, you you know, you you start really digging into it halfway through the book. You you actually uh, put forth something called the media richness theory, which you know is really that you know the 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 stronger the media, the better the the, the better the project, and you know the the richer media or mediums is in the end it's face to face, isn't it? And that's the biggest challenge that we have when we're dealing with hybrid is that. I mean, listen, my projects, when we are face to face, um, th there is, it, it is a richer experience than where you're just dealing with somebody online. And that's what that theory says, right? Yeah, it, it was interesting looking back at that and again, seeing how much it held up. Um, it, it's also important to note that in some ways, the online world actually is more inclusive. I've seen research again from Future Forum about how, particularly if you're an underrepresented group. Yeah. You actually might feel more free because yeah. think, I mean, you know this as well as I do being in those meetings. Yeah. Right? The CXO is going to, in some cases, dominate the meeting. People are going to kiss ass. Um, mm -hmm. That's just in inevitable. But in, in theory, a tool like Slack or Microsoft Teams can level the playing field. Um, and that's both good and bad. You could say, well, everyone's got a voice. But then you think, well, you know, that means anyone could say anything. Yeah. And that's yeah. not necessarily a good thing versus if you are in person, you just get a sense of the room just by people's reactions to someone and you you shoot your mouth off and send a bunch of emojis. Oh, wait, was that the VP? Oops. Yeah. And that, that, that might be a hard bell to one ring. So, yeah, I, I tried to set the context in the first two parts of the book 
um, before I get to the prescriptions, because I just thought it was kind of facile to say, do this, don't do that. Uh, particularly, I think it's in chapter one, which I mentioned the, not to get all political, but just, mm -hmm. this country is pro-employer. You could say mm -hmm. that's good. You could say mm -hmm. that's bad. I'm just mm -hmm. saying it is. And mm -hmm. the U.S. is one of three in, industrialized countries not to offer paid leave. Mm -hmm. So when COVID happened, it was this once in a lifetime opportunity to invert things for so long. We've had our personal lives revolve around our professional lives. Right. And with hybrid and remote work, we've been able to flip that. So we've been able to become, I would argue, better citizens, have more balanced lives, exercise more, um, see our family members, whatever you like to do. So that's why people aren't going to give this up. And I'm just fascinated as these companies announce playtime's over because um, so many companies have seen the light. And you see this in the data. I think it was LinkedIn. I, I think I quoted in this book. Uh, they said that uh, year after the pandemic, the number of job uh, job descriptions with the word remote had spiked. I think it was three hundred and fifty seven percent. So enough companies get it. I'm, I'm not again. I'm not saying that you have to always be in the office or you could not be productive at home. But I, I, I am really curious to see how some of those graphs that I put in the book ultimately play out. You know, you say that um, with all the benefits of working from home, and you're absolutely right. There are a lot of benefits from a mental health uh, balance, from uh, you know, from uh, family time that you're spending, for you know, the, the more independence and mobility over your day. One of the downsides that you write about, though, is about um, social capital and how you know working from home does erode that. Um, what do you mean by social capital? Yeah, I mean, a lot of research suggests that if two people are equal, the one who gets the promotion is the one who maybe has the better relationship with the decision makers. So right. if you were mid-career, like maybe I am or you are, and you already have known people for five to seven years, then if you see them on Zoom, what's the big deal? But if you just graduated from college or you're new to a company, I'm sorry, who the hell are you? So sure. you miss these opportunities. Tony Shea, rest in peace, um, used to talk about collisions. So even though the research on that is very mixed, but there's this mythology out there about running into someone at the water cooler and they have this great idea. I know Google, I covered this in my book on analytics, did specific research. This is fascinating about the plate sizes because mm. they didn't want them to be too big because mm. if you did, you would A, waste food and then B, um, eat too much and not be healthy. But then you wouldn't go back and maybe bump into someone. They also did research on the length of the lunch line. If it was more than 15 minutes, people said, oh, I'm not going to wait for this. Mm. I'll come back later. Mm -hmm. And if it was shorter, right, they wouldn't have that time online to meet someone from another part of the company and say, what are you working on? So, mm. you know, I, I tried to do the research. But yeah, if you don't, getting back to your question, um, have any skin in the game, not just it hurt, hurting you as an employee, but also from the employer's perspective or management's perspective. Think about this. If I've got no social capital, right, if you're just an email address to me. And I can not even have to move, right? And I can get another remote job that pays 7% more. Yeah. Look, if you make $30,000 a year, 7% is significant. Yeah. But if you make $100,000 a year, 7% pre-tax, if you really like your company and the management, all right, that's tougher to justify making the move. So sure. it does behoove people. That's why one of my recommendations is to get together. And I don't have the right number. It could be once a week, once a month, once a quarter, once a year. But we see this with um, Playfair data, one of the sidebars in the book. They specifically twice a year get everyone together to the offices and do something social. And that way, when they are doing the remote or the hybrid project, it's, oh, yeah, I was I was watching whatever, uh, Better Call Saul last night and I thought of you. So it's these uh, social interactions that can go, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to leave that company because I like these folks, even though I can make a little bit more. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, you, you do keep getting back to that, which is, you know, uh, you know, it, and, and it gets back to the title of the book. I mean, it's hybrid, hybrid, hybrid. There is obviously all the benefits and the reality of people working from a home, but all of that sort of, you know, FaceTime is needed. And otherwise that social capital goes away. You also say, you know, you know, when you're giving advice to both, you know, employees and managers about being collaborative and, you know, really making the effort to spend time to get to know your, your colleagues and your partners and your fellow workers as it is, you know, and um, you also, you also give some advice that says, um, you, you say to think face up, not face down. And I'm curious what that means. Is that some like, um, you know, reference to just drinking too much on the job? <laughs> no, I don't think I've made any drinking jokes in this one. <laughs> 
Uh, but that's yeah, what was missing from the book. <laughs> there you go. Uh, ne- next edition. Next edition. Uh, I mean, if I'm coming into an office, and again, if, when I watch the videos of companies like Citrus and LinkedIn that have spent millions of dollars redesigning their offices, yeah, I think Citrix. This was interesting. So pre-pandemic, their headquarters, I think it was in Manhattan. Seventy percent of the space was dedicated to face-down individual work, desks and cubicles, whatever. Right okay. now, they inverted it. Now, 70% of the space is for face up. So I'm talking to colleagues. I'm meeting with them. We're brainstorming. It's it's a physical meeting. It's not checking email because you can argue you can do that from home, right? right? What's the point? So yeah, if you're going into the office, you do want to be more face up as opposed to face down. And I think that business travel in general is going to be more purposeful, right? If it's employee training, yeah, I can do that online, but we both know that people are going to be checking their phones and not paying attention and not get as much out of it. Right. But there are other instances in which, you know what, it's Friday, it's a half day, or it's the day before Thanksgiving, traffic's going to be crazy. Why don't we do it in this way? So there are going to be these judgment calls that managers have to make, and you're going to see some inequities, right? Well, how come they have to come in? We don't have to come in. And in fact, I discovered this working on the new book, something like, um, actually, it's 100%, according to a Chicago, University of Chicago study, 100% of IT jobs can be performed remotely. Hmm. (laughs) So that's a tough one, because those folks are very much in demand. So I, I, you know, certain things like physical security, if you're a chef, that's kind of hard to do remotely, maybe in 10 years, we'll have robotic arms that we can control. (laughs) But it's, um, you know, it's, I I just don't see how you get around just because you can do something in a purely remote fashion, doesn't mean that you should. And if you look at the companies that have been successful, they've been building up muscle memory for remote work for years. I'm talking about Automatic or GitLab. Those two right, companies right. are consistently sort of media darlings right. and their managers are talking on shows like CNBC all the time. Um, they didn't just hit a switch. They've been building up for this for a long time. So hybrid is hard because of proximity bias and some of the things that I mentioned. So hopefully my book helps people get their arms around this. And as I said, improve their batting averages. Uh, you talk a little bit about technology in the book as well. Um, you know, and and you are a big fan of project management platforms. You, um, I mean, you you say in the book how you know if you're just using just a spreadsheet to manage a project, you're you're probably missing out on some of the things that you should be thinking of. Um, which leads me to believe that, like, if you some people put push off investing in a project management application or a platform mainly because they don't want to conform to that platform. You know, they have their way of doing it. But, you know, I I seem to get the take from you, Phil, that, you know, if you if you adopt a good project management platform, you'll learn from it because it will, you know, if you follow the way it works, it will it will think of things or help you think of things you wouldn't normally have thought about on your own. So 100 percent. And and even towards the end of the book, I mentioned how the company Reich um, had announced that they had embedded artificial intelligence. So let's say it's a client website Mm -hmm. launch. Mm-hmm. Well, they can take anonymized data and identify a red flag before you even see it. Right. And you might think, yeah, this is totally fine. Or you might be able to identify which people don't see as engaged right. because you look at, for example, how quickly they used to update their tasks and how infrequently they do now or how much longer it takes them or do they have a staffing issue. All that becomes impossible to ascertain um, if you're just doing this through a bunch of disparate emails or I mean, spreadsheets are fine. If it's a, you know, if you and I, to, hypothetically, if we, we call, we called this podcast, a project, yeah, we, yeah. something like Reich might've been overkill, sure. but if you've got a six month long endeavor with 10 different people involved, the idea that it's just going to be a spreadsheet or a Google doc is insane. And yes, sometimes companies do skimp on not just purchasing the license, but then providing and training to the employees. If I had a nickel gene for every time I showed someone something or someone showed me something, go, how did you do that? But you know, it's it's I think irresponsible and very misguided for management to assume that people will pick up all these different chotskis and their intricacies on their own time. And sometimes towards the end of the project, you've probably seen this happen. You found out about a feature of a tool. And had you known about this yeah. at the beginning, you'd say, oh my gosh, that would have saved us hours and hours. But I've seen consistently how companies will skip on training. There's an example from my previous book about how a VP at a healthcare company, after talking to me about a potential training session, said, you know what, we'll just buy a bunch of copies of Zoom for dummies and they can learn it on their own. Yeah, if you think that nurses working 14-hour days in the middle of a pandemic are going to come home, kick their shoes off, open a bottle of red and read Phil Simon's Zoom for dummies, you're out of your freaking mind. <laughs> 
you know, it, it's funny that you mentioned that about, about these applications as well, about, you know, taking the time to learn and all this stuff. The, um, don't, don't you agree that most of the mainstream project management applications, there are a bunch of them that are out there, um, they're mature enough now that they don't need a lot of customizations. I mean, if the, if the majority of the time was spent in just learning how to use the existing application out of the box, it would probably provide, you know, provide the biggest return on investment to anybody running a project. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I violently agree with you. I mean, yes, <laughs> is it possible that you thought of something that the Asana or Reich yeah. folks or Basecamp or base folks camper, did? Yeah. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And in fact, my current book is called No Code, Low Code. So make a long story short, even if you're not a programmer, you can build fields into Notion and Coda and, and all these other ones that will let you track something. But sure. Yeah, I mean, look, I've, I've said this more times than I can count. We'd love to blame technology because it can't blame us back. And <laughs> if, again, if I had a nickel for every time I sat in a meeting and someone says, well, this application doesn't do X, Y, and Z, <laughs> I might say, well, it actually does, or it does something really similar, or yeah. you don't need X, Y, and Z. I, yeah. I remember sitting down one time with the head of benefits at a large retailer in Manhattan, said, I need all these reports. So I said, yeah. all right, explain them to me. What is this one? Oh, I don't know, but we need it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. 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 You got it. Done. Or what does this one do? Well, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that somebody needs it at some point. So, yeah. I mean, look, the, the, using the tech well will not guarantee success, but I can pretty much guarantee you that the converse is true. Yeah. If you don't use the tech well, then I find it. It's again, is it possible? Sure, but in particularly not just the tech, but the data you get from it. That's why one of the last chapters in the book is on analytics. Yeah. Because we're all dispersed, it is important for us to quickly be able to see which parts of a project, which people are behind schedule, who needs help. Yeah. Whereas before, if you and I are in a meeting or I just see you in the hallway and get a vibe that things aren't going well, I may not get that vibe because you're probably not on Zoom just sitting here like this working all day. Right. Uh, so those types of things, I think, again, they only increase the odds of success. We're getting near the end of the conversation, and you actually uh, you know, brought up the final thing. I, I want I, I I'm skipping over uh, you know some of the concepts that you discuss in the book, which are really fascinating, like a a project pre mortem, whatever the hell that is. You're gonna have to read the book to understand that. Uh, what a project pilot is and how to run one. But you mentioned analytics, so let, let's talk about that. I mean, most good projects have good analytics around them. They've got you you give an example of like a project management dashboard. And you also talk about um you know performance reviews and rewarding employees based on the analytics. And I thought maybe we could just sort of end with this, you know, that, you know, like Phil, like what are first of all, what what are some of the key analytics that you think are or might be even unique to a, a hybrid led project? And what are some of the performance you know, perks that you would, that you would, you know, recommend providing based on certain of these analytics. Gosh, we can have a very long discussion about yeah, that, but I see discussion. nothing wrong with, with spot bonuses. Okay. You know what? You went above and beyond and you busted your hump all weekend. And, you know, I can remember even the lack, the lack of that can be a real, um, how do I put this politely? Um, annoyance. Yeah. So going back, coming full circle, coming back to that um, Philadelphia project from 2006, I remember. And again, th this wasn't hybrid. You couldn't do the work from home. You needed to be there. Fine. So on Friday, I packed up from the hotel and went to work and was in, going to drive to back to New Jersey at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Long story short, project wasn't going well. They said, we need you to be here on Saturday morning. So I had to drive home, unpack, check back in the hotel. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. I get it on Sunday morning at eight o'clock. Nothing. If they had gotten me a donut, and I'm a big donut fan, but to quote the immortal words of Homer Simpson, donuts, mm, is there anything they can't do? <laughs> uh, that little gesture would have gone a long way. So, you know, in terms of which specific numbers, again, I, I wrote a, a separate book about analytics, but I thought it was really interesting to look at what the data can tell us. And there's an example of the book from a from another book, a Project Management Analytics, about a construction company that was just hemorrhaging funds. And they determined that it was largely because of turnover, but then they did root cause analysis. Well, what's causing the turnover? And it turns out that there's a compensation issue, but also there's an issue with employee training. Mm -hmm. So they're frustrated. They don't get the training that they need. So again, I just think it's important to uh, look at the data and, and yes, it won't necessarily tell you the whole story, but I, I would counter the claims of your old school data phobe project managers. I don't need no stinking data to tell me what's going on. <laughs> 
because again, I believe in the power of this stuff. Now, again, you can misuse it. And then let's not forget about Goodhart's law. Once we know what people are managing toward or measuring against, we can sort of tilt the scales for that. The classic example is where we need to pay people on the number of nails they produce. Okay, fine. I'm going to create a bunch of these little nails smaller than thumbtacks that no one can use. No, 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 we can't do that. We have to uh, compensate them on the size of the nail. Okay, fine. Then it's a nail the size of the house that needs a <laughs> crane to pick up. That doesn't make any sense either. So it doesn't take much um, intelligence to juke the stats. But I, I do think that, yes, there's a subjective part. And I'm not saying you could quantify everything, but if it's just, oh, I like Gene, he's getting the job done. Okay, well, what does the data say? And if Gene is consistently not doing his work, it doesn't mean that Gene's lazy. Maybe Gene needs training. Gene is actually doing three different jobs. I actually mentioned the work of a Babson College professor whose name escapes me right now, who did some fascinating work around network analysis, and they could determine which people were actually, irrespective of title, contributing in ways that were so valuable that if, let's say, they made 50 grand a year and said, look, I got an offer to go for 55 Maybe you can't match that, but wouldn't you want to have that conversation about how essential that person was in terms of informal responsibilities and just overall influence? So right. um, I cover a lot of ground, even though it's not a, a short book, but right. you know, hopefully people will will give it a shout. The book is called Project Management in the Hybrid Workplace. I've been talking with Phil Simon. Phil, thank you so much. It was a great book um, and you know one of many, and I'm sure many more to come. So I, I appreciate you taking the time to write this. And I recommend anybody reading it who is running projects or involved in projects, big or small. So thanks very much, Phil, for joining. Thank you, Gene. Everybody, you've been watching and or listening to Biz Books. My name is Gene Marks. I will be back in a couple of weeks with another interview with another great author like Phil about whatever business book that person happened to write. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Appreciate you being there. We will see you again soon. Take care.